Well, one could realistic, realistically ask what it is. A genuine, honest-to-gosh question. It's valid. It's a question that a lot of people ask a lot of times about a lot of things. What it is... It's a question that could be asked about this strange object that I'm waving about in front of my camera. It's a question that could be asked about the disembodied voice that you hear in the background. It's a question you could ask about many, 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 many things. So we might as well just stop asking questions and sink our teeth right into the vegan meat of the matter and get it going because what it is, is this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Mazel tov, everybody. Greetings, salutations. Welcome aboard. Good to be back here, which is all live on the dreaded Facebook. Wednesday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I say it every week when I'm on the air, set your calendars by it. I'm a man of steady habits from the land of steady habits. The Hat City, Danbury, Connecticut, where I turn on the faucet and get an unlimited supply of that delicious, fortified with heavy metal, Danbury tap. Let's take a swig of that. Hello, Alan. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Hello, James, who is back from his Icelandic adventure. That's pretty cool, man. James Pogo of the Arm Delight Rifles, one of Connecticut's finest, oddest punk rock bands, was traipsing around in Iceland recently. And I'm uh, mildly envious, somewhat, somewhat jealous. Um, I've never been to Iceland. <clears throat> I almost kind of sort of had a chance once on my second UK tour, which was back in 2019. I was booking flights over and um, Iceland Air had some really affordable, cheap flights. Uh, of course, the punchline with Iceland Air is that you have to stay over for a night or two because they want you to, you know, they want to get some of your tourist dollars. And I thought, well, gosh dang, if I could if I could scare up a gig in Iceland, I'll do it. That'd be really cool. So, you know, I did some internet sleuthing and found a couple of uh, DIY promoters in Reykjavik who, you know, as a lot of DIY promoters do, they say, yeah, man, we want touring bands to come over and play. Well, we love you. We need places. We need to have people come over and play. We've got to have people play. We'll do anything to have you come and play for us. Write us, call us, please. So I wrote and of course heard nothing, zero. Did not even hear one syllable from the hitherto eager beavers of Reykjavik who were desperate for people to play at their DIY venue. That's the life sometimes of a DIY musician. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's one of the things that I really don't miss that much about booking my own shows. Uh, I love playing, I love traveling, I love meeting people. It's one of the best things that there is to do on this little mud ball that we're all stuck on. But gall dang it, I hate booking the shows. I hate booking the shows, I hate booking the shows. That's why I'm so very, very happy to report that in my main gig, as you know, or if you don't, in the almighty anti-scene, we, the band, have just signed to the Atomic Booking Agency. Our agent is Joey Killingsworth. And he is so far been Johnny on the spot with getting us some really good shows. And uh, you might have guessed that's our lead in now to check the bulletin board on this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Yes, we are going to check the bulletin board and see what's happening. The bulletin board slash calendar Anti-scene shows in the merry month of March, which we are now officially in. Today is March Day, I guess. Very, very soon. March 9th at the Switchyard in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. March 10th at Bears in Shreveport, Louisiana. The March 11th at the uh, Alabama Music Box in Mobile, Alabama. 
March 12th at Siberia in New Orleans, Louisiana. If any of you people out there are denizens of the Gulf State, come on out. Because we intend to rock you tonight and all of those nights as well. Then looking forward to April. We got Atlanta, Georgia on April 6th. Charlotte, North Carolina, April 7th. Chattanooga, Tennessee on April 8th. And Nashville, Tennessee on April 9th. And I do believe, and I, I'm not speaking in an official capacity, but I do believe that that is quite likely to be it until the 40th anniversary show in September, which is September 30th at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg. We've got a very exciting undercard lined up for that one. We, of course, are going to go out there with guns a-blazing, because you only do a 40th anniversary show once in a lifetime. So September 30th in Spartanburg. Start making your travel plans now. Soon, in proximity to all these other events, right here in Danbury, Connecticut, on May 6th, we've got the next Danbury Record and CD Expo. It is Connecticut's longest-running record show. I co-promote it. We've been doing it since 1997. And guess what? I, I will be in town for this one. Yay! Got a whole room full of dealers. It's the VFW Hall, number 149, in downtown Danbury, May 6th. I intend to fill up at least two tables full of records, tapes, CDs, and there's going to be probably plus minus 30 or so other dealers in the room with me. So start saving those dollars and get ready for May 6th in Danbury. Yes. Now let's see. we got a whole bunch of comments coming in here. i got to put on my dollar store cheater readers to see... Um, Who's saying what? James Pogo says, anti-scene East Coast dates? Question mark, question mark, question mark. We want to. We absolutely want to. Uh, the word is in with our booking agent, Joey Killingsworth, at Atomic Booking Agency, that we do want to play the East Coast. It's just a matter of when. Really, it's just a matter of when. We had some logistical problems that we were ironing out, and I think they've been ironed out. So, you know, it's really just a matter of where and when, and, you know, how it relates to the 40th anniversary show coming up. So, um, I would say, actually, hold your breath. Do hold your breath. You're not going to jeopardize yourself if you hold your breath, because we intend to deliver on this one. Who else is saying what? Vaughn, none of your damn business says it. Uh, we old codgers got to store up your energy for the big show. I don't know who he's talking about. I personally have a surfeit of energy. I don't need to save anything up. Um... I could go out my front door right now and run for three miles and come back and do Tent Talks tunes. So nothing to worry about there, Vaughn. And then let's see all kinds of other comments, which I'll be checking after I get off the air. So let's see. That's the bulletin board. Let's check the mailbox. And the mailbox uh, does directly relate. Well, it actually doesn't. I'll, I'll take that back. It doesn't directly relate to anything except the mailbox. Because I got a lot of records to talk about but none of them came in the mail. We did get some very exciting ones. Let me lean over here real quick so you guys can get a good grip, a good view of that gleaming forehead of mine. Oh, yes. Um, in the mail, we got a couple of exciting things that came in the mail, a few exciting things. One, this is a, a fanboy thing that I mail ordered. Um, actually, I showed you this one already. I showed you my signed copy, and... Um, John Truby and the Ugly Janitors of America, A Blind Man's Penis, and other smash hits. I got an autographed copy. Apparently the first copy that he sent me was this sealed original, which he, he forgot to autograph. So he sent me an autographed copy. So now I got one to keep and one to sell. So if you guys want to hear some really awesome, amazing, bizarre shiznit, including the title cut, which I guarantee... If you love the absurd, this is going to keep you living for years and years and years past your normal expiration date. A Blind Man's Penis by John Truby. Sun Maximus knows what I'm talking about. Sun Maximus is the uh, producer of the upcoming movie about Gary Forney, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago, which I'm extremely proud and excited to be a part of. So guys, keep your eyes on that. So yes, excess John Truby vinyl. 
it's available. What else did I get? I thought I swore for sure I had shown you guys this, but I had not. Y'all know that I've got my label, TPOS, which I draw your attention to every single week here on Tent Talks Tunes, and the fact that I've got Discogs, I've got eBay, I've got Bandcamp. What might you find on some of those fine, fine internet locations? Well, you will find this, which officially exists now. It did not exist until recently, but now it does. It's for real. The Tiny Tim Test Pressing. And once again, forgive me if I showed you this already. I think I might have, but just to be doubly sure, Tiny Tim Prisoner of Love Test Pressing. Only 10 made. I got five. My good pal Mark at Punk Media, who did the original version of this, has got the other five. It's never appeared on full-length vinyl before. And now it is legit on full-length vinyl. It's right here. See? TPOS Test Pressing. It says right there, TPOS Catalog Number 239. This is number two of ten. I got all the even-numbered ones. He got all the odd-numbered ones. I've already sold a couple. I might sell one or two more if anybody really wants to know. But I'm definitely keeping number two for myself. Hey, Gary Forney is here himself, the subject of the movie. We got the subject and the creator of the movie, Gary. Let's have a big thumbs up for these guys. Gary says he got to see Tiny live in the 1970s. Man, Gary, I am so envious because I never got to see Tiny Tim live. I, I was late to the Tiny Tim party. It wasn't until I read the incredible biography about Tiny Tim entitled Eternal Troubadour, written by a dude named Justin Martell. That book blew my mind. It made me realize just how legit Tiny was and still is. And it also led directly to the release of the first Tiny record I did on my label, the split 7-inch with Tiny Tim and his protege Isidore Fertel. This is amazing. you got to hear it to believe it. Tiny does a song called I Made a Wee Wee in My Panties. Most likely autobiographical. So legit, so real. you got to love it. It's available. The full-length LP will be available relatively soon. It's like once you got the test pressing in hand, the regular test pressing is just a matter of I don't know, however, however many weeks, I don't know, but weeks behind. So very excited about that. Greg Crawford said that he suddenly has the urge to purchase vinyl. You've come to the right place, Greg Crawford. If you like cool, awesome, old 45 RPM singles, you've hit the vein. Ah, what else was I going to show you people? Where the heck did it go? Oh, <laughs> duh. Been teasing this one for a while, but now it actually is out. Officially 100% legit. You might have seen me teasing it on my page. But here it is. In the real, in the raw. It is absolutely happening. It is now. It is live. Officially on vinyl. On my label, TPOS. Alistair Crowley. Poems and Invocations. Full length LP. There's the front. There's the back. I designed the entire package myself. Front label, side A. Back label, side B. I love the way this thing came out. It came out great. I also included as a bonus four, count them, one, two, three, four ambient soundscapes on the album that, that finish off side two of this album that I used to, because uh, the, the original recording was made in 1919, only come out to like 20 something minutes. So I created these, I think, really cool ambient soundscapes to put on the end of it to make a full length LP. And I thought it came out great. I am very, very happy with this. And uh, people have responded very positively to it so far. So if you want it, talk to me. It's on eBay. It's on Discogs. Um, I will be taking these stores down in a couple of days before I leave. But they are still up and I'm still working like a dog to fill your mail orders. Yes, yours, yours, yours. 
So, we've checked the bulletin board, we've checked the mailbox, let's have some tent talking tunes. One of the absolute joys of the many joys I have in my life and career as a full-time professional record seller and full-time professional label guy and full-time professional musician. I don't know, maybe I'm actually just part-timers on all of those. You know, because I, you know, when I'm not playing music, I'm buying and selling records. When I'm not buying and selling records, I'm releasing records. When I'm not doing that, I will sometimes, on occasion, record bands. You know, I do a lot of stuff. If it involves music and I can apply my skill set to it and I like what it is I'm doing, I'll do it. And between all of that, I managed to pay the bills. So a toast to 100% DIY, baby. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, Callie says that he is really stoked to hear my ambient remixes on the Crowley record. Thank you, Callie. Callie is a man who knows what he's talking about. He is a noise and sound artist himself. Callie, if you want to post a link to your stuff, please feel free to. Um, and Sun Maximus asks if people will vote for the film Gary on the Lift Off Film Festival in Program Set 1. I think not only because I'm in the movie, just saying, not only because I love the music of Gary Forney, and not only because Sun got the job done, well, actually, those are all the reasons I can think of to vote for Gary. Just do it, people. Just do it. <sighs> all right. Um, what was I yapping about? Oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Joys, yak, yak, yak. Records, blah, 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 blah. Buying record collections. Yes, I love buying a record collections. And um, I'm extremely embarrassed right now because my main man, Adam Zisser from Atlanta, Georgia, from Hotlanta, sent me a big box of records. And I scattermindedly, scatterbrainedly, absentmindedly forgot the box. It's in my car. And I've actually been dying to crack that box open. And I want to do it live here on Tent Talks Tunes. But I've been so out of my mind with trying to keep up with the mail order I've got and get ready to hit the road for these gigs that Adam, I'm sorry, your giant, huge box of records had somehow slipped my mind. So I am going to open it. The people are going to see a live unboxing of an honest-to-gosh record collection here on Tent Talks Tunes. It just won't be tonight. So that gives everybody something to look forward to. That gives me something to look forward to. And Adam, please, accept my, my heartfelt, scatterbrained apologies for having not <laughs> remembered to bring that great big box of records in from my car. Oh, my God. So anyway, yeah, I go out and I buy records from, you know, anybody who's got a collection. People write to me. They call me. They message me. They say, hey, you know, uh, my grandma, she had a whole attic full of them, uh, those vinyls. Is that what they call them these days? Uh, vinyls. Mm, nah, mm, nah. Um, are you interested in buying them? My answer is always yes. I'm always interested in buying. I can never guarantee that I actually will buy anything because any of you people out there who are record hounds know, and I'm sure I got a lot of you people out there who are record hounds and collectors. You people know that if you go to your average tag sale, or flea market, or if you work in a record store, you know that the average collection that comes in when people want to sell you records, 98.6% of it is garbage, junk, effluvia, refuse, poo-poo, it ain't worth jack. There's nobody on this planet I will safely say, who is going to buy old Glenn Miller 78s. Nobody's going to buy old Bing Crosby 78s. Nobody but nobody wants to buy The First Family by Vaughn Meter. 
Nobody, nobody wants your aunt's Barbara Streisand records. There is not one living, breathing person on this planet who wants to buy those scratchy old Barry Manilow records. Nobody. Now, of course, having said that, I'm going to get some posts from people saying, you know, I've been looking for the first mix of the first Barry Manilow record for a very long time. Well, stand on my skull and call me shorty. There's an exception to every rule. But 98.6% of the time, nobody, nobody wants those beat up old Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush albums that your uncle had and he spilled the bong water all over them. Nobody wants them. As Greg Crawford just said, sentimental does not equal money. True fact. Very true fact. Of course, Miranda says, Miranda from Pensacola, the lead singer of Future Hate, she says, unless you're trying to torture your family and or roommates. Very true. Very, very true. But I... I try to be a nice guy. I don't do stuff like that. Anyway, everybody knows, especially when you're in the biz, you've got to look at everything. You've got to plow through everything that comes your way. You have to, because you never know what might be lurking behind that completely destroyed, wrecked copy of the Jackson 5 ABC. You never know. It's probably another, it's probably an Osmond's record, but it might be something that is actually really good. So you got to look. And I recently um, got a call to look at a collection of old 45s. And um, it took me a while to finally make it over there. And when I got there, it was kind of the same deal. It was like a, a real, a whole lot of 45s, all from like the 50s and 60s. And... About 98.6% of them were just terrible. Doris Day and Mitch Miller and, uh, you know, Tab Hunter, like whatever. But you know what I'm talking about. If any of you guys have suffered the pain that I suffer when you're in pursuit of records, you know, how many, how many Singing Dogs records can you look at how many Annette Funicello records? I mean, ugh, it never ends. It never ends. So this collection was like that. Yes, it was like that. It was like that. But there were some good ones. There were some good ones. And that's what we're going to talk about today. These records all came from one collection. None of them are earth-shattering, you know, bank-busting, block-busting rarities. But they're all good. They're just really good cool records to have and they're all in pretty decent shape and that's sort of like the main selling point for a lot of these a lot of these records are really common but the fact that they're in really good shape is what sets these apart so for example we found a couple of original sun 45s here's one by jerry lee lewis yes it's great balls of fire on the original sun record label and it's in pretty dang good shape it's got you win again on the B side. And you guys can actually kind of see the, the sheen on the vinyl as I hold it up. No scratches, no scuffs, no gouges. It's clean. I mean, you find these records a lot, but they're usually just completely, utterly destroyed. This one's clean. So we got Jerry Lee, Great Balls of Fire. We got Jerry Lee. Oops, sorry about that. We got Johnny Cash, Big River, backed with Ballad of a Teenage Queen, which is pretty hokey, but Big River. Now that's a Johnny Cash A-side, kids. Also in very nice shape. And here you go, man. You cannot go wrong with, on the original Sun, Johnny Cash, I Walk the Line on the A-side. And Hey Porter on the B side. Original. And this one in particular has got the Sun Hiss on it. Original Sun Hiss. Uh, basically, the early Sun pressings were cut on machines that were made for 78 RPM records. So the, the grooves are very wide and deep. So you get the sound of a hiss playing when you drop it in there. And there's nothing like it. Completely original OG. 
So if anybody out there would like to purchase a nice triumvirate of original Sun 45s, you got one Jerry Lee and two Johnny Cash. They're all in really good shape, hand curated by myself, needle tested by myself. I played every single one of these. They sound great. They look great. They're for sale. Talk to me, kids. Talk to me. Two Johnnies and a Jerry Lee. Boom. They can be yours, and I guarantee you the price is right. All right. See, we're having fun already, man. The fact that these records were purchased at a record store somewhere in New York State and basically sat in a closet for the better, like 70 years, basically. And like I was pretty much the first guy to unearth them in a very, very long time. And man, such history, you know, the sun hiss. The, 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 this was actually pressed most likely in Memphis at Sun's local pressing plant. You know, I mean, that's just great. That's real living history. This is better than going to a museum. In a, in a museum, they wouldn't let you touch it, let alone buy it take it home and play it on your own record player far better than a museum love this stuff here's a couple this net the set of records is actually kind of thematically linked a little bit two records one ivory joe hunter on the original atlantic label i'm going to show you the b-side so that's the original Atlantic. I mean, actually, if you want to be really technical, Atlantic's original, original labels were yellow. The orange and black came later. But you'll still lack that you'll still note that there is no Atlantic Whirlpool under the leg of the A. The super duper later a classic Atlantic design had the whirlpool right there in that blank spot. So this is an earlier Atlantic pressing of Ivory Joe Hunter doing You Can't Stop That Rockin' and Rollin'. You Can't Stop That Rockin' and... Or You Can't Stop This Rockin' and Rollin'. It is a song from 1956 telling all those uptight white people that you can't stop this rockin' and rollin'. Don't even bother. It's a very, very polite track it doesn't really cut loose there's no grit or distortion it's a very clean recording with lots of chirpy background chirpy background vocals but ivory joe hunter makes the point very subtly that rock and roll is music that has been around for a long time that it was ripped off and that it's an original black form of music and it ain't going away so you can't stop this rocking and rolling. Very good. On Atlantic, get it from me in really good shape. The uh, counterpoint to that one, actually not a counterpoint, the companion piece is a, uh, a record by a guy named Billy Ford. It's called The Monster. And The Monster is, of course, rock and roll. This is, this is a very light, white, and bright record on the, sun, on the Swan label. But the message is the same. He's like, you know, you guys are scared to death of this rock and roll stuff, but there's nothing wrong with it. It ain't going away. So you've got a white guy and a black guy from 1956 and 1957 saying, forget it. You can't stop this rocking and rolling. I like that message. I like it a lot. I like being here in 2023 sharing it with you people. These records are both original. They're both clean. They're both for sale. Talk to me, people. Talk to me. All right. Here's something. Oh, boy. I was pretty happy to see this one. You don't come across these too often. 1959. Seattle, Washington. A band who I would have loved to have seen at the place and at the time. Apparently one of the most savage rock and roll combos ever. We're talking about the Whalers, kids. The fabulous Whalers. This is a 1959 pressing on the Golden Crest label. Tall, cool one on the A-side. Roadrunner on the B. You can see the spindle hole got a little bit chewed up somewhere along the line. I don't know, I don't know why that is. 
it's a weird, uh, weird bit of wear, but the vinyl is clean. It plays great. 1959 original in pretty dang good shape for sale. If anybody out there loves the Sonics, and who doesn't love the Sonics? The Sonics, also from Seattle, stated numerous times that all they wanted to do was be as good as the Whalers. If that ain't recommendation for the Whalers, I don't know what is. Eww, boy, ah, talk about awesome rock and roll on the original vinyl. 100% OG. How about some Bo Diddley kids? Bo Diddley is a gunslinger. This is actually a, a second pressing on the checker label. The original checker label had this really wild hand-drawn logo with a sort of, lot, sort of like stylized checkerboard on top. For this one, they actually got some type. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. I just sneezed live on Facebook. Woo! Vaughn Va Va says it looks like it had the shit played out of it. It did not. It actually plays very nicely. It plays real clean. It's kind of the same with that Whalers record. It's got some weird wear on the spindle hole. I don't know why. But once again, you can see the sheen on the vinyl. There are no scratches. There are no scuffs. There are no gouges. If I recall correctly, it plays with that original 78 mastering hiss. But it, it sounds great. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's got signifying blues on the B-side, which is... Uh, Bo Diddley and Jerome having a cutting contest where they play the dozens on each other. Really, really good stuff. Good, affordable copy that plays just fine. Talk to me. Oh, man. We've got a couple that are... Oh, here, actually, here's another Bo Diddley. Also on the second version of the Checker label. Bo Diddley cracking up. Very nice condition. My, in my intro to this song was the Rolling Stones, actually. Near the B-side, the great-grandfather. Bo Diddley on this record sings the great-grandpappy. But on the label it says the great-grandfather. I guess maybe they're trying to anglicize him a little bit. I don't know. Very, very good double A-side. But yeah, Cracking Up. The first time I ever heard Cracking Up was by the Stones on their Love You Live album from 1977. And I love that version. Really good version by the Stones from 77. And also uh, Mo Tucker. Mo Tucker from uh, the Velvet Underground, who cut quite a few really good solo albums of her own, um, starting in the early 80s and going all the way up until about the mid-90s. She does a really good version of Cracking Up too, which is based more on Bo Diddley's original. The Stones, you know, as they always do, retooled it and rearranged it to sound more like the Stones, but... Bo Tucker was pretty, pretty faithful to Bo Diddley's version. And any fan of the Velvet Underground will tell you, if you've done your history and you've done your studying, Bo, Bo Diddley was Mo Tucker's number one influence when it came to playing drums. So big old toast to Mo Tucker and to Bo Diddley, <clears throat> all of whom were cracking up. Now, we got a few more rock and roll ones here. These ones, um, these are a little bit pricier because they're a little bit rarer. They're not like, I said, we're not earth-shatteringly rare, but uh, how about this? School Day by Chuck Berry. That is original chess, 1957, and it is almost in mint condition. Super, super clean condition, this, this Chuck Berry with uh, deep feeling, a nice blues on the back. That is 100% OG chess, and it is clean. I've pointed out before on Tent Talks Tunes that Chuck Berry <clears throat> and this guy here, Elvis Presley, they did the exact same thing. Elvis always gets the big time credit for fusing white hillbilly music with black R&B music and creating rock and roll, Chuck Berry did the exact same thing. 
Chuck Berry took the blues and the R&B and fused it with country music, and he came up with his own brand of rock and roll. And uh, it's, it's kind of weird because if you listen to Chuck Berry's music very closely, you can hear that country influence. It is absolutely like Maybelline, for example. Maybelline is a rockabilly tune, dude. It's the exact same thing that Elvis was doing. And I'm sure the, the scholars can get together and you know debate over who did it first. Was it Elvis or Chuck Berry? I don't know. But they each did the exact same thing with their own spin on it. And uh, we're all a lot better off for it. So yeah, I've got this original Chuck Berry School Day in beautiful condition. And I also have this Elvis record that I opened up the program with. This is a really weird thing that RCA was doing in the mid-60s. The so-called... Uh, Compact 33 Double. It was their version of the EP. And you may or may not know that in England, the EP was always a, a big format in which you would have four songs or so on a seven inch record. It's a format that never caught on in the States, which is a real shame, at least, at least until punk rock and new wave came along. Then you had EPs out the wazoo, but as far as mainstream rock and roll went, in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, EPs were never, ever an issue. But um, RCA tried, and I thought they did it in a really cool fashion. Small hole, 33 and a third RPM, with a really cool, like, heavy cardboard sleeve. It's more like a, the texture of it is more of an album cover than a 45 sleeve. With lighter notes and everything. And it's got four great tunes on it. Flaming Star. Flaming Star. Now, my first thought when I went to put this on the turntable was, oh my god, more Elvis soundtrack music. But Flaming Star is actually really good. It, it is as good as anything he did that was non-soundtrack. It's a really good tune. And then it's got What Are You Lonesome Tonight on the B-side, and uh, It's Now or Never, and also uh, Summer Kisses, Winter Tears, which is another soundtrack song which is actually not too bad. But Flaming Star was like the, the, the pleasant surprise on this one. And it's on a really bizarre, arcane, discontinued format. And it's got an RCA picture sleeve, which I think is anachronistic, but there it is. And also in dang near mint condition. If you want it, talk to me. It is for sale. Uh, Dwayne Ewell is signing off to go to work. Sorry, Dwayne. My apologies. My condolences. But uh, go out there and earn some dough so you can buy some records. Cheers. And if anybody is wondering who I'm talking to, like if you're watching this on my YouTube channel in the future, remember, we're live. This is live interaction with us. We, you, the people. Talking about records and music and having fun. Ooh, here's another one. Oh my god, it's an original. This record has been repressed any number of times. It's been bootlegged, it's been counterfeited. But this is 100% original 1957. I will vouch for it. Larry Williams. Boney Maroney. Larry Williams, I think, is one of the unsung heroes of 1950s rock and roll and R&B. The Beatles covered a bunch of his songs. Um, he was on the same label as Little Richard. Of course, everybody knows the song Boney Maroney, but this is the original, baby. Original ass-kicking version by Larry Williams in pristine condition. The B-side is You Bug Me, Baby. And, you know, I'll just mention, as I have again, the record itself is not rare, but the condition that it's in, that's what, make, that's what makes it desirable. It's in beautiful condition. I was pleasantly surprised when I exhumed this one. It's for sale. Hit me up if you want it. How about this one? Oh my god. You just get so happy when you see a record like this in such beautiful condition from 1958. Directly, practically, from 1958 to you with me as the conduit on the original Cadence label. Can you read that, kids? Do you see what that says? Do you understand the import of that? That's Rumble by Link Ray. 
I need say no more. Mm, 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 mm. B side, the swag. And you can see the condition that vinyl is in. I ain't gonna say no mo, except if you want it. Vaughn says that Rumble by Link Ray was Jimmy Page's favorite record. That makes sense. Um, Apache, here's, a, here's another factoid that's kind of related to that. Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath's favorite record of all time was Apache by The Shadows, another really cool guitar-driven instrumental. And um, listening to it, you would never associate it with Black Sabbath ever, but true fact, a toast to those wild guitar instrumentals. <clears throat> These are the roots of our culture, people. This stuff's important, and it's great. Now, you people out there know I love my, eccentric bleh, my eccentricities and my weirdos and my left-to-center stuff. This is one of the, the best examples ever of a genuinely outside dude who had a hit record. The only hit record this guy ever had in the States. And I think I read somewhere that it was the first British produced hit record that ever charted in the U.S. I'm not really sure. This guy had a lot of hits in England. And his story, it's his story is one of those stories you just cannot make up because it's just so bizarre and so weird. But uh, you, you wouldn't know. You look at that beautiful original London Records label from 1962. The song's called Telstar. The artist is called The Tornadoes. And the B-side is called Jungle Fever. Now, The Tornadoes was a uh, one of the many, 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 many pseudonymous band names used by, by a guy named Joe Meek. That's Joe, M-E-E-K, Joe Meek. And long story short, this guy had a homemade, self-built DIY recording studio in his little apartment in England, and he produced dozens and dozens and dozens of some of the weirdest sounding records you ever heard. And a lot of them were hits in the UK and Telstar by the Tornadoes was his big hit in the U S and, um, yeah, his story mm, had quite the ending, but trust me, gang, you got to look that one up. James Pogo has confirmed what I thought I read that the Tornadoes Telstar was the first British single to go number one in the USA. Thank you, James Fogo, James Ogo, for that factoid. We live for factoids. Now, <clears throat> if Joe Meek had the first British hit in the U.S. charts in 1962, these guys did not have any hits at all in 1963. They were British. Their singles came out in the U.S. In fact, the, the label that was responsible for releasing their stuff in the U.S. flat out refused to release their records when they were offered by the U.K. label. The American record company said, there's no way we're going to release this stuff. It's garbage. Go away. Don't bother us. So their producer um, farmed the tracks out to whatever independent record label he could find that would release this band's music because the big label wouldn't do it. So in 1963, that's why you had this record here on the Swan Record Company by this band called The Beatles, a song called She Loves You. And uh, it wasn't a hit. Was not a hit. She Loves You is not a hit. The B-side, I'll Get You, was not a hit. Until, of course, the American Record Company did finally have their arms twisted enough to finally release 
the record or one of the records that the uh, parent company wanted them to release, which was on, yes, the parent company, Capitol Records, I Want to Hold Your Hand, a year later in 1964. Talk about a double A side, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and I Saw Her Standing There. That is some kick-ass rock and roll, kids, from 1964. That's the hit single. Once again, very common, easy to find, but not in this condition. Not with that beautiful shine on the wax. Oh yeah. This is a one, this is a copy you can listen to with great pleasure. Same deal with the one I just showed you. She loves you on Swan. Once the Beatles were big and huge, Swan started pressing these records by the truckload. Truckload. And you find them all the time. Whoops, sorry, Swan. <laughs> you find these things all the time, but never in good condition. As Vaughn said, beautiful. And another one of the labels that um, condescended to release Beatles records before they were famous was VJ Records out of Chicago. And this is one that's uh, that was released after Beatlemania, but it's on the really cool original silver and black bracket label. Do you want to know a secret? Backed with Thank You Girl. There's a picture sleeve for this one that's pretty damn rare. The vinyl itself, same deal. It's just a really, really nice nice condition. It's one you can look at. It's one you can play. It's one you can show off to your friends. Yes, 1964. And there was one more that I got. Another Beatles record. One that was originally not released, or I should say, these two songs, Love Me Do, and... P.S. I Love You were on the very first pressings of the very first Beatles record to be released in the U.S., which was introducing the Beatles on V.J. But it turns out that V.J. had not paid the publisher to use those songs. If I have my, if I have my factoids correct, V.J. had released P.S. I Love You and Love Me Do as a single, but didn't pay the royalties. So when it came time to put those tracks on the album, the publisher sued or objected or whatever, and the tracks were pulled. So original versions of the album with those tracks are extremely rare. But then once they started selling lots and lots of records with the two substitute songs they put on that album, they had the money to pay the publisher, get the rights back to the song, and then they pressed it up as a 45, as a standalone 45. So if anybody bought this record as a 45 in 1964, it was on the Tolly label, which is a VJ budget subsidiary, because they finally paid the royalties. How's that for a twisted Byzantine tale, but it's oh so typical of the record business? Makes you want to pinch your nose. <clears throat> Chad Cochran says that the Beatles were Elvis's competition. The girls love them. That is true. And I do believe that's the main reason, actually not that exact reason, but close, the main reason that Capitol Records refused to release their records in the U.S. was because Capitol had their own little fiefdom measured out. They were selling tons of Al Martino records, gobs of Stan Kenton records, millions of Jackie Gleason records. You know, they, they had the market cornered on easy listening white guy jazz. And they didn't want anything to upset that apple cart. They did not want anything to mess up their good thing. Especially this worthless teenage music. They didn't want that. They wanted to sell lots and lots and lots of Al Martino records. And lots and lots of Melocrino Strings records until the end of fucking time. That's why they gave the big thumbs down to the Beatles. And, uh, well, does anybody even know what the Melancrino strings sound like? 
anymore? Has anybody even known what the melancrino strings sound like for the last 50 years or so? I don't think so. Corporate record companies and kiss my ass. I'm running out of a little bit of time here, but I got a couple more to show for you. I got a few more here. Here's a really good one. Another record that this one actually you don't find too often at all in any condition, but this is a Stone Cold original maroon and gold Atco pressing. The coasters. One kiss led to another. Yes, that is original Adco. That's the same label design that Adco used on its 78 RPM records before 45s were a thing. They took the 78 label design and adopted it for 45s. And that is, gosh dang, original 1956 on Adco in stellar condition. Really cool tune called Brazil on the B-side, sort of like an exotica rumba song by the Coasters. Gorgeous condition. I was kind of tempted to keep this one for myself. And don't worry, folks, there were quite a few I did keep for myself. I'm just showing you the ones that I'm selling. Probably not enough time in the day to show you everything. This one's pretty cool. This one's not in the greatest condition in the world, but for those of you who are soul music completists, The Falcons, You're So Fine, featuring a very young Wilson Pickett. Great stuff. Plays beautifully. Just doesn't doesn't have the same eye appeal that a lot of these others have. Young Wilson Pickett, man. One thing I've always been on the prowl for are the very early, early Otis Redding sides before he got signed to Atco. He cut some wild ass R and B records uh, before he got famous, and they've been comped and bootlegged a lot. I it's always on my on my my radar to try to find original Wilson Pickett records. And I think he was in a band, but I don't remember the name of it. If anybody out there wants to post some information on that, was Otis Redding in a group in the early days, or was he always was he always a solo guy? Let me know. My inquiring mind wants to know. And I got a few more, but I think you guys pretty much have the basic idea. I'm kind of out of time anyway. I got a lot of stuff to take care of before I hit the road, kids. So, yeah, I'm going to sign off. I'll mention, too, that I will not be on the air next week because of the rock and roll business that I have to tend to. And I'm not totally sure about whether I'm going to be on the air the week after that. But you know me. I'm just like a scratchy old Herb Alpert record. I keep coming back. You can't get rid of me. So there will be 100% more Tent Talks tunes in a future that is very near to you. And Stephen, that was Larry Williams. Larry Williams. So yeah, guys. Hope everybody out there is doing great. Hope that your rock and roll reservoir is filled to the max. I'm going to do the best to top mine off every day, every way. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.